I'm Johnny Hamill, and welcome to Jammin' with Johnny and Casey Bass Stream. I have a unique way of life as a bass player and music educator. I felt like having a podcast long overdue. I'll talk shop with all my creative friends and shine light on things happening in KC. Welcome to Jammin' uh, with Johnny. Um, we have the one and only JJ Jungle, also known as JJ Richards. Uh, one of my true uh, inspirations uh, for me as a bass player, uh, growing up, playing in the bands next to him. And we also have the legend Lisa Mack, drummer for Share UK. And uh, of course, like all of us, we play in lots of other bands too. So the list for Lisa Mack could probably go on a, a, a mile as well as JJ. But we are here uh, to talk a little bit about that. All three bands uh, are gonna play December 22nd at the record yes. bar. A little bit of an yeah. old school 90s throwdown party. Be a family reunion. That's right. For real. For real. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, for the people who don't know, uh, I have a lot of listeners that are young students and uh, they're just on here tuning in to all things bass. We'll, we'll be talking about JJ and his bass playing, but Lisa's also a drummer, which is um, really important to just know the. The drums always affects the bass the most, and uh, what we all do is is um, is uniquely different, and we play differently when we play with different musicians. Um, and uh, I started with that first one because uh, JJ uh, has been part of a what it, what did you call it? All the incarnations of of Mike Dillon's uh, things, or at least that's how I I knew you in the original band Billy Goat. Um, you were, uh, I just remember the day that you walked on stage because I actually know Billy Goat from the other bass player before you. And, um, and Billy Goat is perfect band to say that's punk punk from the 90s, you know, like it's, it's quintessential sound. And so you have that great song, old school, where it's like you, you have that punk rock thing 
distorted bass coming through, raging through your amp, and uh, you just, you know, the shout chorus, and then you have that just coolest, raddest bass line there for the verse, you know, it's like, it just comes out of nowhere, and I, the first time I heard that, I was like, that's the coolest bass line I think I've ever heard, you know? So, <laughs> so kind of a perfect party uh, for, I don't know, I, I, I would definitely describe most of the music from the 90s as much more eclectic than maybe the music from the 80s. I don't know. I was a metalhead, so it was kind of stuck in its own world. Um, All right. It definitely pushed it out of there. Um, but uh, so we've been we've been kind of working on you getting back to Kansas City uh, to play a, a old school show like that yeah. for quite some time. And of course, Lisa used to play uh, with Share UK, and uh, you actually did have the reunion with Mike. Uh, last year and it was an right. amazing show I yes it. it's so good so uh i'm really happy that we're going to be able to do that era of share uk because it's, it's gonna be fun i can't wait yeah and definitely i just for for me i can remember all the times we were just hanging out playing gigs or going to see each other play and uh so many memories that are super yeah. fun uh, I can't believe watching that. So um, after that old school song, the original recording had a, a you know, a, there, it was that band right there that was played. It was a trio, right? That's Mike Dillon's Go Go Jungle. So that's the jungle is me, JJ, and then the Go Go is Go Go Ray on drums, and then Mike Mike D on on percussion and vibes. And so that was a trio. So for that, I'm playing like distorted bass and all of that. I'm trying to play both the guitar line and the bass line at the same time, which was super fun. The original, I was just playing the bass line, which is yeah. great. Um, but when I started Tree, I was like, how can I, you know, how can I take a little bit of what the guitar player originally played and throw yeah. it in? So that there's this little distorted line at the, at the end of the lick where I just, I, Pretty much playing the same thing but i just throw on the distortion you know and uh um it just reminds me because i was watching i haven't seen that thing maybe ever <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh um and and watching mike seeing that mike uh, messed up the lyrics that also made me uh makes la you chuckle bad. Makes you bad. yeah makes, makes me chuckle yeah <laughs> so that, that's that's and and obviously the guitar was sid and we all love sid Yes, we did. You know, so, so that just warms my heart that you even just said that because, you know, he was definitely another great Kansas City player, you know, like he just right. had his sound and, you know, like like Lisa said, we're all kind of family. Yeah. From the Kansas City creative original music scene here that went through the 90s and as you'll as the listeners will find out for you into the 2000s definitely and um and we did it in other carnations for my the band pamper we stopped in 98 because Teresa had kids and settled down and then we started again 20 years later after she was all the kids moved out <laughs> That's what I guess that's what happens, right? Truly family, yeah. Got to be there. Um, yeah. And and I, I said that so. said that to JJ about like uh, that I was we were talking about the dates and stuff, the Mike and Gogo, -Go, and they were just like, whatever, whatever. If JJ needs that, then we'll be there. I don't know what. Yeah. Have some other gigs are done, you know. But I'm just gonna be there. So. Right. Okay. Everybody's super excited to see him, to see him and have him come. And you, you know, for for me um, as a drummer, like looking back on the incarnations of from Billy Goat to Go Go, um, Mike Dill's Go Go Jungle, I think one of the coolest things for me was like taking traditional rhythms and turning them into a punk rock. You know that 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 was super inspiring um, as a young musician for me. 
is to, to listen to all of that and know that, you know, there's all these really cool traditional Latin rhythms happening and it, it's like this loud, aggressive punk rock music. So there's a lot more like thought behind it that, you know, maybe isn't happening in, in other areas, which was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Mike, Mike went to uh, University of North Texas, so he, he, can't, he, he went to a good school. He was the first chair in, in his school, so he had all of that. And then he had the other side of it that was uh, inspired by, by punk rock and by funk and by chili peppers and by all of that. And so me joining the band, I think I joined in August uh, 94, and um, and I I was just somebody who just came in and I just told my parents I was gonna play music like at a young age, uh, not at a young age. I was going to engineering school, and a couple years of my high school, I went to this high school, you know, the high school senior show off where all the bands play, and I remember being backstage, um, and the rest of the band were really freaked out. They were super scared, and I felt. You know, my belly was like, I felt butterflies in my belly. I felt what people would call, I felt nerves. But to me, I didn't translate in my brain as nerves. It felt like excitement. And I was super excited. And uh, as soon as the stage came up, we jumped around. The band's name was uh, Cize Diem, which we didn't, re we, did we messed up on the name Carpe Diem. Or <laughs> 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 and uh, and um, the next day, you know, because I was a super shy kid, people were talking to me, you know, girls noticed me, oh, good show, and that was it. Next thing, I was going to be playing bass forever after that, you know. Um, um, and, and I, you know, I told people, oh, I'm going to tour. I was very confident. I'm going to be a touring musician to the chagrin of my parents. And so when I first met Mike, um, I'm, I met him in person in Dallas, and I felt his leather hands from playing the congas and uh but i also you know i i saw that he, he was he had a lot of messed up things about him but he also had a big good heart and yeah. uh, and um and i was like all right this is the guy <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, he, he, yeah you know exactly yeah and I, I would say as a young musician he when i look back he was probably the most um inspiring musician at that time to me that kind of formed like my interests still to this day. So he, he really was somebody hugely in influential. I, I think on a lot of people. Yeah. To this day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, I, I, I sometimes call Mike my one true walking miracle because, you know, he said there was a lot of messed up stuff about him and he was you know he was he he was uh writing life a little hard and uh um and music kept him alive and i yeah. just, there was time where i walked away and i was just waiting for a phone call to tell tell me that he od'd or something where he wasn't around anymore and um and that was hard for me at that time that time and uh and then he stopped and he put it all in his music and then his uh, he's even more inspirational now because he just plays so hard and i mean he's truly amazing I, as you said the performance aspect about him is is one of the most in, intriguing things about him his playing is stellar uh he does miss some words as you said <laughs> and you know he'll he'll miss something and and it's kind of great you know like sometimes when he messes up is is when he what he does right after that is like pretty amazing <laughs> yeah yeah but, yeah one of the biggest things i learned from him is you know because there's two two schools of thought on how to practice for for um and a lot of bands or musicians they practice in the bedroom or with each other. They'll they'll stay at home, practice once a week, and um, and that's how you get better. And there's nothing wrong with that. He 
though, was in the school of like, no, we're going to go and we're going to tour and that's what's going to get us better. And, um, and it made us get better faster because you had that extra pressure of playing in front of people. And yeah. that uh, thing of like, hey, if you suck, people will give you that direct feedback that you suck. So you're not going to suck for very long because that is really painful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so I really loved that because like when I joined Billy Goat, if I remember my first show too, it was right there in Westport in Kansas City. And in my head, it wasn't that great, <laughs> you know, for me, for what I wanted. But after that tour, it was so much better and continuing to tour. At that time, we were touring like 300 something days a, a, a year. So it was a lot. Um, but, um, you know, we we were all relatively young compared to where we are now. And um, and so we had the energy to do it. And the great thing was, is just knowing when you come back to the KC or some of our bigger places, you're bringing the fact that you've played over and over and over again, and you've developed this bigger bond with each other from playing so much that um, you just knew you're, you know, we, we were, you know, it was a family, like any family on the road. All you guys know from touring um, with bands for 20 plus years that it's a dysfunctional family. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but there is also magic that happens from doing it so long of, um, of synergy that that's in between there too, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's what's great about hearing. I mean, this, this, I mean, like last year when I heard you play with Mike McCoy, uh, it, it was magical because I've heard you play drums with so many other players. In fact, played with you on some of the gigs, you know, and. Yeah. And everything and um but what you do with him is really great you know because obviously i also played with christian and and eric and um and uh he played uh, he he took over after you i think in the band and uh he was fantastic and some of the other drummers in chair great but when you play with him he plays differently you know and when jj plays with mike it's different and you hear that time put in together and you you guys also were the ones that wrote the songs together yeah and and how much that changes everything you know like it's it's really quite extraordinary to yeah you know the story behind the song and you know or what inspired it or where you were at the time and you know and it it's great to like re relive those times and you know something that i've always appreciated going back to Mike and like this is it's kind of the same for you Johnny is like he really loves his friends and it doesn't matter like I I'll get texts from Mike after he's played a show with Les Claypool or like some huge stage like hey how you doing I hope you're doing are you practicing tabla today I just finished like you know a sold out show with Les Claypool and he it doesn't matter where he is or how big of a show he's playing or you know and, and you're the same it's like you you love your friends and you still want to maintain that connection. And and so he, I think he's never forgotten, um, you know, who his people are. And that, that's something that has always been really meaningful to me because it's like, you know, we're all still friends. Yeah. Well, definitely uh, there's some, some people who burn bridges out there <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, they they just do, and 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 Mike's yeah. personality, he could have burned those bridges pretty easily and walked away yeah. because you know things went good on the other side, and that's what I I truly love about him because he's just like, yeah, you let's go play at David Ford's place for no money on Tuesday night. Come on, you know, I, yeah, I've got, I've got a night free or whatever, and I, you know, like. Uh, it's super fun and super amazing and uh, and like sometimes he'll just send me a me message or he'll play he'll send me a riff or something and I'm just like, cool and then I go from it and I write something else off of it or something and it's yeah it's really good and as far as that that goes for me and really important especially why I think you know, sometimes 
we think, oh, I don't want to do a retro show. I'm an artist. I'm moving forward. But Kansas City music really kind of saved me because, you know, Lisa knows me from from the early or the late 80s, you know, right. where we were metalheads. And, um, you know, I loved metal and basically kind of, it was mainly the Metallica Black Album thing, you know, like I felt so betrayed by that. And then also <laughs> all the other great bands going up and starting to make it from, you know, like Nirvana was supposed to just be a grunge rock band and all of a sudden they're being treated like Madonna and shit like that. I mean, so I just wanted to quit. And then, yeah. you know, heard Billy Goat in the first band and I heard, I, I came and saw you play with Cher uh, at, up in Lawrence for your first gig, I think. Uh, when Because, you, you know, you were like, oh, I'm playing with this Cher band. I was like, I saw them in a warehouse uh, with the first drummer or something. I don't know who it was, but, um, and they, it was, and then Sin City Disciples opened. And it was oh, yeah. Woods Weather Road. And I just kind of, it was supposed to be a party. I just stumbled in there to see what was going on. And like the music was there and real. And, and I felt like it was better than all the other shit, you know, like it. Yeah. So that's why I kept going, you know, like a, great and same with hearing pamper for the first time and um, all that stuff was just extraordinary and so i feel like we're just lucky to be in kansas city with all with our family absolutely uh, yeah i i would agree you know and it's funny you talk about like the sellout because we still can't get mike to agree to put the share tunes on spotify or <laughs> Because there's that like purist mentality, you know, that like the old punk rockers we just can't let go of. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I, I we have our leader, Robbie, but he just uh, <laughs> his idea of high tech is uh his his uh home studio was like he had one ga ghetto blaster here and the other one there. <laughs> so he'd record the first track on that one and then he would take the set over and then record it. And so it was like just overdubs on overdubs. It was like 24 tracks of a bunch of overdubs, but don't mess up because yeah. you just got to keep overdubbing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, dysfunctional as far as the business goes would be a good way to describe, you know, uh, a lot of that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, but there's like a certain beauty to that. That's what creates you know, the memories and, you know, all of that. Like I was just recently, uh, there was one point where, you know, we were on tour and the, the tire went flat and, and Mike was duct taping it. <laughs> and and we were like hoping, like, I think he was hoping that uh, like the, the, duct, the duct tape would like melt and like plug the hole, but it only... <laughs> He gets so mad at me when I tell that story, but it's like, <laughs> I still remember it, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like all those crazy things. Pretty funny. Yeah. So. I I always like the story of Billy Goat Van where you guys didn't want to go buy a new solenoid or something. So you bought a <laughs> battery from Walmart and you went from Walmart to Walmart to Walmart and just I, we just bought this battery, man. It's already bad. And then, you know, like, <laughs> it was this guy. Yeah. You did that for a couple months till you... Till you that, that happened quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. That, that's rock and punk rock uh, ethos. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, we better, you know, make sure we, we get there. We, we're functional. <laughs> The Walmart rental that should, that worked really good. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. brother. And uh, the other one would be like I would remember like going in, getting a ride in your guys' van, and then the Pamper van. I don't think I ever rode in the Sherry K van, but it did not smell very good. You know, <laughs> like, it was patchouli oil everywhere. <laughs> 
And it just kind of covered up all the funk, you know. Yeah, well, there's some funk. I, I lived in a house with Mike Dillon, and there was some funk. Oh, yeah. In the Share UK van, we didn't have heat. <laughs> so, like touring, you know, up north and all these cold places with, with no heat and, like, trying not to freeze to death. I hate that. We'd, we'd have to put a quart of oil in the, in the van, like, every 60 miles. <laughs> but that's when gas is, like, 99 cents a gallon. Yeah. So we yeah. could afford to do that. Yes. Yeah, luckily we toured with two dogs. So all of those places, all the cold places, you just cuddle real close to Broccoli and Cosbear. And uh, at least I did. Some people didn't like the dogs. I grew to love the dogs because they can <laughs> be alive. <laughs> yeah. And then there's the idea that somebody always had to sleep in the van, even if you had a hotel, because you didn't want anybody to jack your equipment, you know. Like, Oh, yeah, bags. for sure. Had to have you know you took shifts you know who's gonna sleep out there and if you were if it was freezing you're like oh, it's the worst right yeah, that's true that happened i'm not huh. sure if this is inspirational uh dialogue for any young <laughs> kid out there one that get in the van but it's, it is it is it's like um like i and i say that about all the touring musicians or especially independent touring musicians um, even non-independent, I'm sure it's the same. It's it's like you're we're like America's monks, you know, or Buddhist monks or something like that. You know, where you have to just go out there and I mean the the road is hard. There's and and sometimes you think I don't even get to practice that much because I'm just living in this van for days on end or years, especially yeah. for. for JJ and but you get that hour or two hours of of making this art together you know and like I said for for years let's see you started what you say 90 something? 94 was was when when I started and um, um, and yeah it was straight straight to touring and um, and the funny thing about me, a lot of people didn't like touring because you're in, stuck in the van. It is stinky. You're with, you know, you're just trapped in this incubator. We call it the resentment incubator because <laughs> you just you smell, you feel all the people's bad, all the all the parts are there, right, right in your face. But I personally, I loved it. Like I personally loved seeing the the world go by out the window and all of that. I didn't even mind at the end of the night moving equipment because really that's what you're getting paid to do is move your equipment because yeah. no, all musicians will play for free. We love doing that. So that part is for free. The rest of it, hanging with people and uh, moving your equipment and trying to stay alive. All of those were, I mean, I got so many life lessons. We, we weren't, the, we weren't like a pop band that were in a big giant tour bus, you know, we were in a, a van that was spray painted and we'd get pulled over by police all the time. So many times that I actually got, I, I'm not scared to get pulled over by <laughs> cops because I got pulled over by so many that um, like that fare went away, you know, which was it's interesting when I'm with other people who have been pulled up, who are getting pulled over for the first or second time and they're scared. I'm like, let me handle this because, you know, I've done it too many times, you know, but uh, all of those life lessons, I didn't think uh, they translated to the rest of the world. I thought they were just pigeonholed to music and musicianship until now I'm running a company that DJ that I run a company with, my own employees and we do weddings and DJs and all of those life lessons, it translates like, you know, like slow down, like, you know, this is how you deal with pressure and da da da. Like that comes from that, those years being on the road. It's a trip. Like I didn't realize that that would, I thought it was like just my road musician life. Yeah. But, well, but also you you put yourself out there and you don't realize it. You're just doing it because, like you said, we're just musicians, so we're kind of consumed by it. But you know, like 
you mentioned the idea of just being nervous the first time you play all that stuff you know like it's i mean i've been on stage since i was you know 13 so you know you definitely i mean i remember just being pretty pretty nervous like and i didn't talk at all but man i spoke through the bass and the minute i played that first gig it was over man i knew i wasn't gonna do anything else but that like you like you mentioned you know like it's just like this is it and you know i know i know lisa from way back and you were just i think i met you the first year you were playing drums but you were just beginning yeah I, I yep actually i was just reliving a story of that where that space on minnesota avenue when you had your practice space in there and kent was down the hall yeah so, <laughs> that was way back way back and, and you were and i remember you know how much like i i just remember distinctly about how much drive you had about learning the drum and how much, like, how consumed you were by it. I mean, and that was, so I, I knew, even though you were just beginning, I was like, you're gonna be a monster, you just need time, you know, and you would, and like, like you said, I, I just watched you walk into all those different things. And the same with me, I mean, I loved, you know, I didn't know that I loved classical music or jazz, you know, I didn't. Yeah. Like it, it I, if you would have took my 13, 14 year old, so uh, no way. And then I, just, right. something happened where it just opened up, like I said, about the local music scene and, and how that changed. Um, the, the neat part about all, all three of us are, we're all from different places. Cause Lisa, you're kind of, I mean, you're from blue Springs, but even farther out, I think. Right. Cause Right. Out first to your house, you're like, come visit my dead horse. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I'm from the city, man. I don't... But, uh, and then JJ, you're... I don't think it went exactly like that. I just had a horse that passed away and I, <laughs> it was like dead. We were like, that's something. I thought we were oh going to Lisa Country. You, you definitely had some, <laughs> some country mannerisms, you know, like you, you, you were. You were from the country. To me. I mean, I'm from 7th Street, so. And of course, uh, JJ, I think you're originally from Jamaica, right? You grew up there and you moved here or? I Yeah, my I mean, I was actually born in DC, but my mom is Jamaican and my dad is from South America. And so I would go as a kid back and forth from Jamaica to the States and then finally you know, went, grew up in Houston or did the rest of my schooling in Houston. And then um, where I um, saw um, Mike was up in north of Dallas and Denton. And then from there moved to Kansas City. So, right. Yeah. And so that's probably what I wanted to just say that to anyone out there is like, I don't, for me, when I'm teaching a student or any young musician, like, I don't really care where you're from. If you get that bug and you love it, then go for it. You know, like, I mean, my parents didn't want me to do that until I just couldn't, they knew I couldn't do anything else. And uh, yeah. I'm sure both of you have some, you know, parents, they, they want to protect you. So, you know, it makes sense. My, my, my parents were very supportive, but you know, they were also like, when are you going to stop doing that? You know? <laughs> 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 not my dad he was like this is what you're doing and you've chosen it and when i didn't feel like practicing tough i was going to practice and that was it so it was like when i committed to it he he uh like there was no argument there so it became in, it became ingrained because you know when you're a teenager like sometimes you don't feel like practicing you want to go hang out with your friends but he he didn't that wasn't really an option for me, <laughs> which was good. I'm super thankful for it now. Yeah, I never had any trouble practicing. I had the opposite. It was, you would have to shut me up. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop playing. Stop practicing. <laughs> Go do something. <laughs> so I know this this uh, podcast is kind of focused on 
the the Kansas City um, stuff. But you know, JJ uh, played in this super gr- like great band that has become one of my. It's on my playlist all the time. Is the Coup, and I love that band. So people should should check that out because he he did some really cool stuff on there. And um, I think that they did as a band. They did a lot of really cool shows and <clears throat> things like that. I, yeah, I, that's something that you did when you moved away from Kansas City, right? Or was that? Different? Yeah, yeah. I eventually um, um, was living in Oakland, California. So, uh, and that's where I met with Boots Riley, who's the head of the coup. Now he's like a big writer, director, movie person. So he's written a bunch and and put out a few movies and series. So, um, but yeah, the coup is like. In the 90s, the same same time as when when Billy Goat and all those bands were playing, you know, um, from Boots' world, you know, um, hip hop was getting big, you know, and he was an activist and um, but also started a hip hop band and saw that these record companies, I guess, you know, some they'd signed one band from Oakland. And all of a sudden, the record company's like, oh, Oakland is the next place for hip hop. So they were just signing up all these art, uh, artists. And so that's where the coup got their first record deal. And they they made a point of touring with uh, live musicians from fairly early. So, um, yeah, that that band took me all over the place, all over the planet quite a few times. So um, yeah. super and that band, that. You, you got. You met them while you were playing in Billy Goat or just your connection with Billy Goat or was it random? And then you- I saw them. The first time I saw them was um, um, they, I was touring with uh, Harry Apes and um, in California and they were opening for like Primus or one of Les Claypool's bands. And so that was the first time I saw them. But um, it was I was introduced to them because somebody who was tour managing Mike Dillon's Go Go Jungle also tour managed their band, and he saw the he saw that their bass player was like they were always fighting, and he was like, "Man, I know a bass player for you. You guys won't fight." And he's he's yeah. he'll you know he'll be perfect. So um, when that opportunity came up, I jumped in. So yeah. Yeah. And I was recently listening to an interview that Boots did, and he was talking about how at that point in time, like touring with a live band was he, like the coup. That was one of the first bands, hip hop bands to do that because everybody was using program music. And then like later on, they added he added a drummer. But so he, he was kind of a revolutionary, I think, in that way, too, like just making because he wanted that energy live instead of just. Um, touring with program music is that right oh, that's true yeah yeah so um, it's it, it was hard to tour because a lot of hip-hop bands especially back then was just um, you know two MCs and a, and a DJ and so you go you know when you when you're a hip-hop head uh, when they go and see a show they're ready that's what they're programmed to see and um so a live band comes out there and everybody's like loud and loud guitars and loud everything and they're like yeah but we're 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 ready for where's the hip-hop where's the head nod where's that and we're like in your face that's what we are you know (laughs) so uh sometimes the promoters didn't know because we're more like a rock act than uh hip hop, traditional hip hop act, you know. So um, that was that was interesting to to see how see that world. Because that was different than the Mike Dillon world. The Mike it, with Mike D, especially the later bands, we were kind of embraced by the um, the jam bandish community because we played longer songs over time and uh, that was different, you know, than mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, Another thing Boots was talking about is uh, how, like in the beginning, he didn't write any choruses because he was he he was trying to be a purist, and the label was trying to talk him into writing cor- choruses. And of course, he rejected that. And then later, he was like, "Oh, maybe that's a good idea." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we all got to be artists, so <laughs> <laughs> whether it's detrimental or not. Yeah. 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 And and. If I remember right, I remember the, I mean, 
was trying to place it because you, you posted a lot of the two performances on there and you had a couple of videos and you were like right out front and you 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 didn't do this as much in Billy Goat or I don't remember seeing you do this, but you have a very unique dance. She's and, a capoeira master. Yeah, and, and it turns <laughs> out at first I was like, whoa, JJ, and he's like, I mean, just clearing the bar, everybody had to move away and you started <laughs> dancing. I was like, oh my God, I, you know, like you're a pretty laid back guy and all of a sudden you're doing this stuff. And I was like, <laughs> crap you know like that's like, amazing so you got a little bit of that on the video um which is really extraordinary i don't know how you do that man yeah that came that came impromptu actually it was i'm in uh arcade or i'm in humboldt county california now and it was the first show that we played here and there's a song at the end of the set where everybody gets a solo and it came to my solo and um i was just like I don't, I don't know. I did a so, you know, I've never been a, I've been always the backup as a bass player. You're the backup for somebody else's solo. And there's this whole story that the bass player, like there's a joke, you know, what do you do when, when you, when the bass player is doing a solo, you go get a drink. You know, I didn't want anybody to go get a drink, you know? So I was just like, what am I going to do? And that's what came out is I started you know, jumping around and trying to flip around with the with the bass. And then at the end of the show, my uh, boots said, uh, hey, man, I didn't know you did that. You got to do that all the time. And so that became a thing, you know, which I didn't mean it to. It was a, a spontaneous expression. But um, then I tried to get better at doing it, you know. So. <laughs> but but you you were studying capoeira. Like, yeah, I was studying capoeira and kicking. And there's this move where you uh, you have your hand on the ground and you kick one handed kick uh, in the air. So I was like, oh, I wonder if I can do it with my bass, if I can do this move with my bass in the hand. And I never tried it. You know, it was just something in my head like, oh, I wonder if this could happen. And then I tried it and it worked. I mean, my, uh, you know, my bass, this is my bass right here. And uh, you can see there's a big bolt in the back and there's uh, epoxy. So it didn't really work every time. Uh, um, it didn't work a lot of times, but um, you know, um, the, the, it, it gave me something else because again, like, you know, I was, I loved all the beautiful chops master bass players like the Jaco Pastorius and all of these folks. And I also knew wanted to be unique in some way you know how, how can i put my stamp on it and i didn't ever think it was necessarily through just bass playing that's how come i like to sing at the same time and do all these other things because i wanted to be a musician that played bass as opposed to a, just a bass player because I, I i didn't think i could ever get the chops of the jockos there were so many great Jocko S players, and I wasn't one of them. <laughs> you know, so. there, there was something that I remember talking to you like early on, you know, just hanging out, uh, you know, and we were talking about, you know, Claypool, and you were like, yeah, the first time I heard him, I was like, well, that's great. And I went to my bass and I tried to play it, and I was like, no, I don't wanna, I, cause everybody's gonna sound like him. And that, I, I was like blown away because that, that, and then I remember like what the next day or something, I was watching you play and just like, ah, uh, you know, I mean, I had already, like I said, been struck by how you approach the bass, everything, your deep rhythm, your deep sense of rhythm, like, um, you know, most punk rockers are on top of the beat and you were behind the beat when you play the funk. So it makes it much more funky <laughs> like you've got deep as gogo -Go says you've got deep pockets I mean, yeah you know, your groove is like so wide because of where you place the beat you know like it's it's back a little bit behind the beat and it makes it sound so fat um and so uh just that you know you would you you wouldn't get that kind of sound in primus you know at all they don't do that you know, like it's the opposite. And um, and I started with the punk uh, old school song because you're so good at driving a punk song because I, I, 
I think I've told you this before that sometimes when when you heard traditional funk guys, they couldn't really rock out because I just thought, well, they're just not pissed off like like punk guys, you know, they're not, you know, they're just not angry, but that that's not necessarily true. I mean, I don't, I don't think you're a very angry person, uh, but I'm not a very angry person naturally either, but you know, like it's just how I hear the beat and it's usually where, where the bass is placed on top and behind. And also what you, your statement was, was really important because I mean, you sound like JJ when you play the bass, like nobody else. You know, you have your influences, but what you just described is really, really important for anyone out there. Uh, because what's neat, I said that about how Kansas City's sound is really great. It was very unique, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we had some band that were always trying to sound like somebody or whatever, but, you know, we were able to have places to play and grow. And, and you know, like it was, it was a very creative town because A, you had a community, you had places to play, you had people that would show up to the shows and support you. And, uh, you know, that that's an amazing thing for all of, all three of us, all of the bands, you know, like we developed our sound um, and, and that statement at that time was just like, I was blown away by that. You know, like I said, I things statements like that is why I say you're my hero and how much you've influenced me. One of, you know, it's not just because you're a cool guy. I mean, you're a cool guy too, but you know, like how you play the bass, your whole overall sound, your all overall approach to music, you know, like you lent that, you, you you wove it into Billy Goat when you came in, like brilliantly. I mean, you, obviously, I thought you just fit in perfectly, and you know, like your 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 sound and the way that you approach the bass emerged through the music. Um, I I only got to see the first bass player from Billy Goat once. Mm. You know, like the very first band with Earl. Yeah, and then I. I remember, so then Mike and, and Kim move up to Kansas City and, uh, you know, Hawes played bass, which was good. And Jack, Jack played guitar and, uh, and Sid. And they were, they were struggling, you know? Like, I mean, they were struggling to find a cohesive sound. It was still okay. But I remember the day that, that Gogo came, walked out on stage and then you weren't too far along after that. And so like that, that moment I was like, Oh, cause I actually thought Gogo -Go was Earl. Cause you know, I just saw Earl at the, and they, Gogo -Go has that kind of drive on the drums. You know, not, not, there's, there's only so many people that can play like Gogo -Go and Earl. You know? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Amazing. So, uh, and then you came out and it was, lights out so so we're, we're in for a treat if i'm just standing there grinning your whole set you you know that all the work is uh, uh, lisa's patience of of always i i didn't know she called you like all the time like when are you coming when are you coming when are you coming oh so you know i met this boy in front of blockbuster video when he first moved to kansas city yeah and then that was it. But he 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 was my friend. He's my like my one of my favorite people in the whole world, and that'll never change. And so I've been trying to convince him. Like I would actually like get a U-Haul and come get all his things if I could talk him into coming back, but <laughs> he's very resistant. <laughs> so, but he's you know, I think there's a lot of people that when they figure out. Uh, JJ's back. They're gonna be super excited to come see him. Yeah. And his birthday is on the twenty sixth. So that's right. I forgot. Yep, yeah, can't forget that. And so this will be like a celebration of JJ's birth. Finally, twenty one. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I know. Finally oh, made it. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Finally made it. <laughs> um, uh, 
I was thinking about the uh, the slapping that we were talking about with Les. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and play the second song on your video, uh, on your that you sent me. So here it is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what you get when that's what they, oh, going in the recording studio. I better go to. I better get me some new strings. <laughs> change them right before. Probably uh, uh, the next album, you're like, maybe I better change them a couple of days before. Right? Because they keep on going out of tune. <laughs> uh, it, it's such a great groove there, you know, and definitely you can hear how deep of a pocket you have. You know, I know you're you're overcritical of, of of it, but you know, like to me that's just right there. And I remember this whole album Black and White is 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 quintessential early Billy Goat of the JJ era. You know, like it's yeah, yeah. it's the one to listen to. And unfortunately I don't fortunately and unfortunately, uh most of the stuff from the nineties like it's not on YouTube like <laughs> You know, you could go and see the Harry Yates on video and stuff like that, and what we and Go Go Jungle because it's a little bit later. But uh, the Billy Goat stuff and all of the '90s stuff, like a lot of our gigs that we play so much, like there's footage, but it's you know it's on a VHS tape somewhere, and somebody's got to convert it and put it up there, and all three of us are not have time to do that. Um, yeah. No. No. And, no. And uh, so, but that's, you know, like, like I said, so clunky and, and that hits so hard live too, you know, like it's, it was always great, um, you know, the way that you interpret the early Billy Goat stuff is, is amazing. And the way that this stuff really, you, you form this through with everybody in the band and you can hear everybody there. You know, Sid, um, I think Zach's on keyboards, right? And then yep. yeah. Mike and Go-Go and you. I mean, that, to me, that's, I mean, that that's the Billy Goat that I lived the longest with and, uh, and really stellar, stellar, stellar band. And we could claim that from Kansas City because 
develop that sound in Kansas City. That's right. <laughs> and you just live not too far from from Robbie and Teresa. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> right next to Mark Sutherland and right uh, next door. Yeah. And, um, so that that's really a great crew. I don't know if uh, you know, like Teresa said, oh, I can tell you a story about making that line or what you said. Brand new strings are going out of tune as I was doing. Well, it, might, it reminded me, you know, I, at some point, you, you, the story that we talked about with Les, at some point I stopped slap, doing the slap bass technique yeah. because I, you know, like I, I, I deconstructed Jerry was a race car driver and it wasn't that hard. It was two tap on and the way he was doing the hammer ons. I was doing it and then I saw, oh no, like I love this stuff so much. It's gonna, I'm gonna start playing like it. And I saw other bass players on the road who were playing like him. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't, I, I gotta be unique. I cannot be, there's only one less and I don't wanna be a, a, a less copy, you know? So, um, so I actually stopped and unfortunately because there was i was exploring some good stuff there i i hear it i'm like oh man look you know if i kept that that way that'd have been something you know but uh um but i was like oh no i'm not gonna slap the bass anymore because there's that's what that was the first thing that when i picked up the bass somebody said well i was like well what do you do with this thing and somebody handed me a book on how to slap the bass and <laughs> and that so i studied it and that's what i did forever it was like oh yeah you know um and um and then at some point i was like oh i gotta learn how to start taking notes away that's gonna be my thing is like i want to put the notes in the right spot and and not play as much notes because everybody's just kind of especially in, you know everybody's filling the air with notes you know and i just want to what's the minimum thing i can play that really keeps keeps things going is yeah. became my thing which people think is simplistic but um it's it's and that might come from my background being in jamaica or whatever but i've liked how that sounded in the punk rock world or in the punk world or you know that whatever kind of music we were doing well, I was gonna have you play the the next one was Donut, which has a little bit more less. Oh yeah, more of a, a little bit more of how you describe. Obviously, there's so many grooves on this album, from Bacon Boy to you know everything. Oh yeah, like yeah. Great, great grooves. You know, like it's it's a really. We're gonna have to practice if we start playing some Bacon Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one is hundred bucks that you have next, so that's oh, going yeah, into the oh, world. I think yeah. uh, that it was on that same link. If on you the... scroll down, you can do okay. Black and white album. All right, let's see if I can find it. Uh... Probably the same, you know. This is like listen to. Uh, donut, right? Yeah, that this is a great group. Hey, okay, yeah. I got to get through the. And Weird today commercial. We'll learn how to this uh, and switch. okay, okay, and I'm slapping on this one too, man. I used to slap. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Son 
our children Blasting off like a funky buzz Modern Apollo 11 It ain't no job Just as heavy as Saturn 5 You know we got so passive thermal control This is the day of the freaky Virgo Purveying knowledge, rhythmic or rhythm A tribal antenna, a fist as a So shake your feet Y'all bouquet, bouquet, bouquet Let it swing Ah yeah that's that that jams man and you know i know i i forgot about two slap thing yeah. and and i and i even <laughs> to tell you said that i was like i i mean i remember you even saying that yeah i don't want to slap much anymore because i want you know it was part of the unique thing of you being you finding you and i can't recall that you you don't slap on any of the hairy apes and any of the Go go jungle, and is that the only Billy Goat slap stuff, or what? Did Pretty you much. I mean, I was doing a, a no. I actually there is a Harry Ape song uh, where I do it, and it's probably one of my favorite songs uh, um, that I do it. And um, um, so the funny thing is, is 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 like I I still love to do it. You know, it's just it's it's just I. I there was, I, I don't know. I just was wanting to go a different direction, but um, it's yeah, a there's a, and you don't want to get trapped in things, and that's for sure. It's just like anything, you know, like yeah. And then I was exploring the pluck, like plucking, but not slapping. You know, like can I play and just hit it, pull the the string hard enough so it gets that attack? Because I like the attack sound, you know. And then I guess part of it is just have not having the money to buy new bass strings all the time, you know? And so my, my sound ends up, because you slapping with some old bass strings just sounds like foot foot the face. <laughs> sounds dull. Well, and you did that all on your white bass. I can't remember what, that bass was great. I love that bass, man. It was great. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think you, the, the bass that you have behind you is you got that in Harry Apes, right? You didn't have that. I Apes. did. I my my white bass actually got stolen um, from me, and it sucked because like I put in, you know, my it had Bartolini pickups, which I put in myself. It was like it was a Carvin bass, and um, that I was inexpensive, but I made it my own, and it had a my own sound, so. Um, it was my baby, and I thought I'd have her, have her forever, but it got stolen. So then I just went everywhere, and I'm going to play that song if I can find it. Uh, I, I went everywhere, and and I kept on playing that next slap song just <laughs> to see if I could. I don't know if I could find it. Uh, um, anyway, um, but it's called Swordfish. And if I could, pl I found, a, I was like looking for a bass that I could play that slap on it, that song. Um, and that was going to be the bass. And this bass, when I found it, uh, it's an Alembic and it, it was the one that it sounded good on it, you know? Yeah, no, it's a great bass. Yeah. And I, 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 I was trying to remember, I remember and he told me it got stolen because I my bass got stolen somewhere similar like around ninety six or something when we were all practicing the dental building. <laughs> mm. Yes. And, uh, yeah. You gotta not leave your stuff in the car, man. Then get that. Yes, that's that exactly happened. what happened. Yeah. yeah. 
and I, I, I still like, I, I just remember, I mean, I was playing upright, so I got more into upright after that. Cause I was like, I don't even like playing the electric bass cause I don't have that electric bass, you know? Yeah. Until I, I still it. look for that thing every now and then, like, come on. I still look for that. Bass. So if anyone out there, yeah. if you see a easy grab out of a car and it's a guitar, don't take it. It's like stealing somebody's child. It's yeah. a horrible yeah. act, you know? Yeah. Stealing people's gear. They don't, people don't realize how much love the thing. It's know? like stealing your love. Yeah. It's, it's like, whew. Like one time we were, somebody stole all the gear out of the share UK practice space and they hid it in a, like a storage thing beside the space. And Mike looked underneath and we got like all of our gear back. But I mean, you just like your heart breaks. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I'm like shaking right now. Just thinking about my face. <laughs> I could you need a hug. I, I have pictures of it where I'm playing it with, you know, pamper and, and uh, I've gone and tried to find the exact bass and the same. I knew the year and I, I go to every store that had one and play it. And I was like, it's not the same. It's not the same. Right. It's the same. It looks yeah. the same, same brand, but it doesn't feel and, and sound the same. It's yeah. No. Work, so, yeah. Don't steal stuff. I mean, you shouldn't steal stuff anyway, but, you know. If it's a musical instrument, don't do it. Don't no. do it. Um, don't do it. Yeah, so that's the next the next song, the hundred bucks song is one. And then I also put ride in there because it's such a great a riff. And uh so before like what you said about taking notes away, that's why I kinda had that in trajectory because may I didn't think about it, but maybe uh, just those two songs in Black and White are my favorite because they're they're moving more. But I want to say that about that last slap line, it was still had a lot of space in it. And where you put the rhythm makes it so funky. So you could have played that with your fingers, but the rhythm that you're doing there, but my the slap part is great, but the, the chorus on that song is my favorite part. Because I don't know... You know, like I, I mentioned that, you're like, like you are naturally like the coolest guy on the planet, easily. You know, yeah. like, just like you could just say hello to somebody. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. you're just like, hey, I'm pretty cool. You know, like I mean, you're just, but you're also generally one of the happier people. Right? You know, like you said, I was happy driving around in a bus full of stinky people. You know. <laughs> Cuzzling it up to two dogs because it was freezing out. Yeah, I was quite happy, you know. <laughs> uh, so you're naturally pretty happy. Uh, but that chorus, the bass line, I mean, it, it just is pure joy coming out of the bass line. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a great riff and a uh, great chorus, you know. I mean, personally, I think Prince would die to record a bass line like that. I think, you know, there's, there's only so many great bass players who could make a course work like that. And that's what I mean. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, that was a good thing about that time period is, is really, um, I mean, I don't, you know, it's been a while, right, since, since that record was put out. So, um, it was it was recorded in Lawrence, Kansas, but I don't really remember like I remember us recording it. I remember Gogo Ray. He was like that was the first time we heard about the one take wonder of Gogo Ray. You know <laughs> where the whole everything was for for the drum licks was one take. You know and it was like and he was done. He's gone. Like where's Gogo? Oh, he did everything one take. You know, everybody. You all have to go work work on your lines now. <laughs> you know. Yeah, which put put a lot of pressure on everybody else because I wanted to be known. <laughs> like you know, like oh, I got to do mine one take. Can I please? <laughs> uh. no. But um, but uh, what I do remember is that there was a lot of freedom in the, in the creation of these songs. You know, that was kind of a go go s 
song because we we did the our version of the DC Go Go, and so we continue that tradition. There's a few traditions that are in the Mike Dillon lineage of songs. One of them are cumbia, our our version of cumbias, you know, and another one is our version of the DC Go Go music, and um, another one is for our versions of Brazilian music, you know. So all of these are kind of like us him us getting turned on to this music that we heard and go well let's put it through our lens and what what does that mean you know i remember in, in chicago we we're playing the go-go music and um and we were backstage and there was a hip-hop band also backstage i don't know all of a sudden somehow they were upset at us and i don't remember exactly why but they wanted to fight and they were like, what kind of band from Kansas plays go-go anyway? Yeah, we did, you know, so um, all of that's a unique thing. And it's, it's still to, to my to this day is part of the tradition. I still play Cumbia, where my version of Cumbia is and my version of go-go and my version of Brazilian music, you know, it's just. Yeah. Well, we should. Uh, and funk. We just hit a little bit of the hundred bucks and a little bit of the ride, and then we need to talk about you singing, and then and then. All right. Know. Here's hundred bucks. Let's see here. Ba -boom, ba -da boom. All right. Now, here we go. now if you found a hundred bucks on the ground, it wouldn't be worth much. All right. <laughs> distortion on there yeah it's great <laughs> a lot of distortion and, and that 
and that the what's that third riff there, whatever you want to call it, yeah. riff or something, man. It's so great of a study of, like I said, where where you are in the pocket. There makes it fat, and uh, uh, that one that one blows my mind. I, just where you where you place the beat is extraordinarily makes that funky. That's something else. And I know the the riff is the riff, and uh, and also the the opening groove is just like I don't know how you think of that that that. That one blew my mind because I was like, man, it's like, I, I didn't ever think about a rhythm like that over a beat, drum beat like that, you know, and I'm, I don't know if you, when you come up with riffs, is it just what happens to you or you feel like maybe I just don't know where you found that inspiration or you're like, oh, I learned 20 songs to do that or something. But it was so No, I, that one was definitely, uh, you know, I don't know where that one came from besides, besides just, um, so that was John Spies on drums. And uh, we, we recorded that one fairly early. I think we did like one or two tours and then we had to have new merchandise. So uh, we went to the studio really quickly. I'm not sure where that, that came from, except, uh, y you know, part of the, the lineage is that, you know, luckily, even though, you know, I, I was part of the dis demise of Billy Goat, like, I still kept that line of connection with Mike and all of that. So, I mean, and originally just it was kinda... you and Zach from Billy Goat were in Yeah, the exactly. Background. Yeah. On this album, right? Yeah, so Zach had just moved to Austin, um, at um, and uh, and Mike was in outside of Austin, and he was just like, yeah, he he was he was actually playing in with Critters Buggin up in Seattle, and he was like coming down to Austin to get a break from there, and he was like, yeah, let's put a band together, and he. Uh, I wanted to call it the butt moving experience because I wanted it to be something that people dance to, and he wanted to call it uh, Harry Apes because when he was up in Seattle, they would look at girls, and uh, the they had a sound person with them and who happened to be a, a female, and so she was like, "Man, you guys are just a bunch of hairy apes," you know? <laughs> and they were just like, "Yeah, we are!" Ah! So that's what he wanted to call it. So we just that both the names combined into that word named the band. <laughs> and BMX is, of course, every person our age is driving our, our first taste of freedom mobility. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yeah. 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 Well, may, maybe we should go on to this idea of you singing and playing uh, for time's sake. And um, yeah. I could drive right in there, too, so people can hear it. Uh, okay, of course, usually we put links to all this stuff so people just check you out. Um, but just to recap that idea that you started in Billy Go and then that band kind of disbanded. And I should say this to anyone listening, you know, like when Billy Go played, the clubs were packed, you know, like you guys always, you know, it was a party as well as a celebration, great music, and the atmosphere was always fun, uh, you know, party. It was a good party. And uh, so always great. I mean, some some stage antics went on in Billy Goat that, you know, <laughs> kind of legendary, which meant usually, you know, people were naked on stage and there was chocolate syrup poured on things and stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, in, in, good time. A lot of cornflakes thrown out, and um, but it uh, it was always really uh, like I said, a big party. And for, I don't know if you did this every Billy Goat show, but most of them would always end in a percussion jam out in front of the the club because the club was closed down because it was too late, and so there'd be like every the whole crowd was like shakers and and just like playing percussion till sometimes it felt like the sun came up 
Uh, we are, we actually um, got ticketed in uh, in Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio, for bringing because uh, that was the thing, you know. At the end of the show, we take this percussion line um, out. Uh, we might play one of these songs that have a percussion at the end, and then we like, you know, um, um, yeah, just bring the line of people outside. So we empty the bar for them. They don't have to worry about that. They just have to worry about cleaning the cornflakes and chocolate syrup out of their monitors now while we're <laughs> gone. But once what, we're in Cleveland and we go outside and we're playing and all of a sudden we're getting arrested like for disturbing the peace, uh, you know? And so it always didn't work out the way we wanted, but um, <laughs> But for the most part, it was a, the club owners were like really thankful a lot of times. Besides being pissed off that we had just ruined our monitors, but yeah. So Johnny, for uh, JJ's fiftieth birthday, his family made, made this like video for him, and his family is just this very supportive, kind, religious, lovely family. <laughs> One of his, his sister's remark on the video is when she first went to go see uh, Billy Goat, she had never seen so many, she didn't realize there were so many different uh, types of pubic hair. <laughs> yeah, well, you, yeah. Get know. you get to know. Yeah. Okay. That was really... Things you learn at a Billy Goat show. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Shred, your, shred your threads. <laughs> You know, get up there. Um, well, I I did want to say that there's that other aspect about the Billy Goat, and and Lisa kind of hinted about this that the Latin influence, Latin American influence, or you know, um, you mentioned your father was South American, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, it doesn't really matter which country South America you're coming from. There's a lot more percussion involved in. The, the traditional music uh and again one of the things that i was struck with because i was a drummer before i was a bass player so i was i went through marching band and was always playing you know the, the bass drum part where you got to go boom 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 and the other bass drums doing the other rhythm and so you got to really count and you just hear this part that locks in together and so immediately when i first heard you playing the bass like the way we just heard some of those lines, like the hundred bucks, it's like, it, it is like one of those parts in a percussion ensemble where it, it's, if you don't think of the whole thing together, then it doesn't really make sense. But you hear the whole thing together and you're just like, it's like the coolest thing ever. So I think the fact that you guys stopped at the end of the show and I, I saw you with, you would have a drum, but you were, you were part of it, but you were, you know, Mike obviously was doing all the lead solo stuff, but you were kind of like driving the rhythm with the drum the same way you were doing with the bass. And, um, you know, like, that's what's so great about this interview for young kids. You know, like, I like to play bass solos. I can play a lot of fast notes and, of course, love it. It's awesome. It's got its place. Uh, but when I hear the bass players that I really truly admire sometimes like what I'm describing to you is like you just find the right perfect part and it just opens up the whole song you know and it can, it can fit in there and that's why that imaginative line at the beginning of 100 bucks and um, everything there's always something the way that you come up with something um, it's just a great study so. Yeah, you know, um, Brad Hauser, who played with us, he played with the Edie Brickell and New Bohemians, rest in peace. He's not yeah. with us on this planet anymore, but he gave me one of the biggest compliments that I've ever had. He was just like, he was a very supportive person and somebody I looked up to as a bass player because his bass lines were very unique. Sometimes they just had these wonderful melodies like like if you listen to the Edie, Edie Brickell songs and like they have these beautiful, he has a great melodic air for yeah. his bass lines. But he t told me after one of the, play we were in uh, New Orleans for Jazz Fest. He's like, man, JJ, like when you're playing sometimes, I'm not like listening to you. But when you stop, I know that you've, that, that you've stopped. And that was like, 
that for me was what it was about. It was like, you might not be like, oh, ooh, listen to the bass player, but you know when like something's missing as soon as, as soon as, you know, which is, it's some people, you know, you want the attention. Us, us as bass players are human. We want the attention also. And we see that the drummer and the guitar player are getting it all. So you kind of want to be the showy person. But for me, it's like, well, how can I lift all these people? And also in my head, my ego gets off on the fact that, guess what? If I stop this whole thing, this whole thing would just crash. <laughs> so, it, wouldn't, yeah. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make people... What do you say? But moving experience. That's that's yeah. make one. Um, uh, I I saw you and your brother do a duo down in Austin at, at uh, South by Southwest, and it was like uh, it was a pretty early show after South by. So it really looked like everybody was like barely had gotten coffee or they hadn't woke up, and so they were really they all looked a little hungover, and and. That was like the most riveting because you had like, they all went from Ugh, to dancing like crazy. And um, it was really, that was great because you had you and your brother and just a bass and, a, and you had a laptop, I believe, playing to some tracks. And I was like, you could do anything because you move people with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's one of the things that I that um, I'm into now. Um, like, I've always been into singing. I was a choir kid, so I was a singer first, and then um, and so so playing bass to me was like it's really hard to play bass and sing at the same time because. Uh, Unlike a guitar where you can just kind of play the rhythm, you know, the bass a lot of times is going the exact opposite of the of the vocal melody. So you really have to um, work on it, slow the songs down to figure out where, and especially like even big, great bass players, like if you listen that sing, if you listen to them, um, like if you break down their lines, like they're, there's they're a way that they play that um supports the the voice you know it's it's kind of crazy um and and so i got really into that um and then i was like i don't know i've always liked one man band so i also got into singing and playing the keep can i play the keyboard while i play the bass can i can i uh you know can i drum hit the drum with my foot can i you know <laughs> Can I do too much? Like I wanted to tap dance while playing the upright, but that was really goofy looking. Like it sounded good in my head till I did it, you know. And so, um, but I came up with this term poly uh, instrumentalist as someone, uh, unlike a multi instrumentalist who plays a bunch of instruments, which is a lot of those. The poly instrumentalist was playing a bunch of instruments at the same time, and. Uh, my brain, maybe I have ADD or something. My brain gets off on like trying to figure out, oh, can I play the bass while playing the keyboard, while keeping informed with this drum loop, while you know, while singing? Can I do all these things that really stretch my brain um, and still keep interactive with the crowd? Because the main thing is to keep people dancing, not um, um, and and so that's. Like uh, that's my big thing these days is like is is doing that and it's it's what I've been driving to do is like um, play a bunch of stuff at the same time because um, I can I've learned I, t I can DJ now like nobody you know like I could DJ in my sleep I've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of gigs doing that and that's not my jam I came from the musician world you know so I have to create in it. And so, um, so that whole that whole thing of how, can I sing? Can I do this? And also, you know, um, one of the great things that I learned in the, all those bands at Mike is the the crowd response, like getting people moving. You know, uh, one one of those songs that Mike does and we do the it's a silly song, but it just goes you know that thing if you say it loud enough and you run in front of people hard enough, everybody can't help but dance like they can't help it or they're just gonna leave you know they're just going he's annoying or after a while they'll you know so 
that's always the goal is like come on people like lose your inhibitions let's let's yeah. act goofy together for a while and you know so yeah, yeah. and moving you know movement for for anyone is important because you know just go sit on the couch for a day or something you know you won't like your body your body oh <laughs> Yeah, like my body doesn't like me. Or a long car ride. I've done a couple long car rides with you. Yes. Um, oh, I just got to get out of there, man. You know, got to. Lisa knows that. She just drove down to Austin. Yeah, that's, yeah. Good. that's a good drive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Riding in a car is, whew, it's um, hard on your body. I think uh, that idea of, I mean, like I said, this, this is already a pretty long episode, which is fine. But um, like so many dimensions of what you're doing, I want you to show them your setup there because a you brought it out and and uh, it's really impressive already. And this really appeals to a lot of people because sometimes in our early you know late teens, early twenties, we can go on the road and you know it's a lot easier. One of the reasons why you're not out on the road is because you you a great father you know and uh that's one of the reasons why you moved away from kc and and went down to austin and and um you know that's part of a musician's life is that we all we have to keep traveling and moving and creating it takes a lot of time energy it's focused um, which is what makes it special but that's not easy to do and and raise a family and Lisa's an amazing mother of how many kids you have because you you've, you're amazing you've adopted well if I say it out loud it makes me sound crazy so let's not say that okay, okay. Like, <laughs> like, 50 I mean, million or something yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's, you you should go you should be in the mommy sainthood category she's, of, she's of the mother of like a whole nation <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and, the and, and, and then if we include like rescue horses and and all the pets <laughs> that you do, I mean you you probably uh, pretty extraordinary. And I, you know I'm a father yeah. too, and uh, it's it's something. And like I said about Teresa, you know, like there there's all, all that all that time and energy. So one of the things about all three of us is that we've never really given up playing music we just have to kind of find our what you said a creative thing our brain needs that i do i do need to stand on stage and play like yeah. I, and i want to play like i'll go play a gig with lisa if if i could fit it in my schedule you know can you come play this gig uh okay yeah i can make it work i, I don't even know i don't even ask what i'm supposed to play i just show up right because um, i just want to look over and see you playing the drums. Yeah, you just want to make music with your friends. Yeah, and, and learn, like you said. Right. Yeah, and same with Mike, same with Marco, Teresa, Robbie, you know, all of them, you know, and, and of course, sometimes we know we can't because, you know, some of them are no longer with us. So, you know, like that makes it even more special when we get together. But uh, let's check out your setup because this is really, I mean, the minute I saw it, I was like, yes, we need to show everybody this because it, it's pretty cool. All right. So I'll take off this mic here. So uh, here is um, this is my DJ setup here, a uh, little controller. This is a turntable that's hooked up to that. Uh, I don't think you can hear it, but I can I can scratch or play through there. Um, I have uh, this a loop pedal here. And then the keyboard, and then my bass is back behind there. So all of that kind of goes through um, through the 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 DJ controller, so I can actually play a track. Um, you know, I can traditional DJ. I can play a track. I can. Um, there's a drum machine right right here also, so I can um, I can play make a drum machine to play with that track, make a live remix of it. I can actually play bass with it. So I can take something that's 
Because one of the great things about DJing and DJing, I do a lot of weddings. Um, and so it's pop music, which back in the day, I would stay away from pop music with like a hundred yards because we were, we were punk rockers, you know, we hated the popular music. Like it was, it wasn't cool, you know? Um, but most of, that's why it's called pop music is popular, you know? And so um, what, what DJing a wedding will teach you is like, oh, this song, this beat, this rhythm, this thing works every time or 99% of the time to get people on the dance floor. So I can take that thing and make something kind of similar to it. And then I get my, uh, my creative fulfillment because now I am playing to this part of this song. And then I can take that away. I can go wherever I want. I can, you know, um, and, um, and so I, you know, that one of the things that, uh, when I first started DJing as a job, you know, I was missing, Mike calls it, um, you know, after a show, he's like, man, did you get your nut? You know, uh, because he played and he, and he felt this feeling of like, ah, I did it, you know? And I didn't get that from DJing. I just got, oh, I served you people good and I did a good job. Uh, thank you, you know? But I never got that feeling of like, oh yeah, I created something and I we had this symbiotic relationship and bam, you know? And uh, so that's what I've been searching for in these all these different ways. And maybe, you know, uh, um, Lisa was just saying she had a, a talk with Johnny Vidakovich and he was talking about the groove and the groove is can only happen with when two people are playing together, you know, yeah. and I've been really contemplating that because I'm like, well, I'm, I'm playing with a non-human or a, a live group of musicians who are playing at their best, I'm playing with them. Am I grooving? You know? <laughs> uh, sometimes it feels like a groove and sometimes it, it doesn't, but just like that's sometimes it is with humans, you know? So um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting exploration of, of still, I'm still searching for the groove, you know, I'm still searching for something that moves people and also moves myself. Um, but where I'm at, I don't have a bunch of musician friends as when I lived in Kansas City. So I got to make friends with with my machines. <laughs> or. Yeah. Or. 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 I could, you could just move KC. <laughs> or. <laughs> hey. You know, be here, man. Uh, uh, it's. Well, that's why I'm super stoked to come to KC here in a couple of weeks and hoping that everybody comes and we can celebrate together because it's been a long time. It's been uh, since um, 2020, I want to say, or 21. And so, um, and that was a really short, weird pandemic time. So it'll be hopefully a time where um, we can all celebrate together and play together and, and, well, and uh, also, as we get, as we get older, you know what I've been finding with the 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 pamper shows, you know, is like we all don't live in the same places, and sometimes people are like a month later, like, "What you guys played?" Oh, you know, like you know, like it's hard to get people out. So, but yeah. I think with, between the three bands, it's going to be off the hook, which makes yeah. it really cool because a we get this relationship like i'm already inspired just by this and i mean i i was inspired like i said just even talking to you on the phone for the first time i was like uh even the rhythm of his speech patterns is like it reminds me of how he plays the bass and (laughs) it's just everything is there um and and so it's a lot of fun and fortunately we get you know we were in great bands, three great bands that made albums that you could still listen to and find. And, you know, we've, we've all been in projects where we just never really quite recorded it. Um, I'm sure all three of us would say, yeah, but there was all these songs that never got recorded or man, we had this one show and we played this one, the one way we played it is it's in my brain forever. I guess that's just our special memory, you know? And, uh, and I'm, 
you know, it's it's really crazy with the Pampers stuff because now you get all these young kids that show up and and it's their parents that have been playing them the Pamper albums. And like when we put out the new album, like I handed it to this lady and she started crying. She was like, I didn't never thought I could ever buy this. Because it reminds them of being young. It, yeah. it really, like, takes them back to that time. It's beautiful. <laughs> Well, but then the, that's the thing is the young kids, they all got like X's on their hands. But they know all the words. Wow. Yeah. And they're like, you are just like, mom would play you guys just right with Led Zeppelin. And, you know, like mm -hmm. you're, you're no different to them. And they're just like, I get to come see you at the record bar. You know, like, so that's it, great. It's pretty cool. So I'm sure that they'll be out and it's, it's going to be fun. And they're good. Hope you enjoyed the episode of Jamming with John and Casey Bass Stream. Please don't forget to check out johnnyhamill.com and caseybassworkshop.com to keep updated on what's new. I would also like to remind you that I'm an independent artist and music educator. I'll continue to shine the light on bass players and work to build cool creative community that does independent art. That includes my own. I deeply appreciate your support of the artists that are interviewed and to support the things that I do. On both websites, there are donation buttons, marketplaces, merchandise, and like buttons. Every little bit helps.